Quasi hereditary algebras, lecture 18, infinite dimensional generalizations. We will spend most of this lecture describing the setup, which we will use to talk about infinite dimensional generalizations of quasi hereditary algebra. And we start with a brief recap on k linear categories and functors. Let k be a field. Recall that a category C is called k linear provided that all home sets between any pair of objects i and j in C, the home set C i j should be a vector space over k, and all compositions are k bilinear maps. Recall that a functor between two k linear categories is called k linear if it induces k linear maps between the corresponding home sets. Example 1. The category of all vector spaces over K is a K linear category. And both the identity and the functor of this category and the zero and the functor of this category, both these functors are K linear functors. Example two, the category of all finite dimensional vector spaces over K is also a K linear category. And example three, if A is an associative K algebra, then both categories of all A modules and all finite dimensional A modules are K linear. Now let us talk about representations of K linear categories. Let K be a field and C a K linear category. Definition, a representation of C, which is also known as a C module, is a K linear functor from C to the category of all k vector spaces. A morphism of two representations of C is a natural transformation of functors. In this way, we define the category of all C modules, or the category of all representations of C over k, as the category of all functors from C to k mod with capital M. The so objects are functors, K linear functors and morphisms are natural transformations of functors. We have the full subcategory C lowercase mod of C uppercase mod consisting of all finitely generated modules. And we also have the full subcategory C LF mod locally finite dimensional modules. And this is the full subcategory of the category of all C modules. And it consists of all modules which are locally finite dimensional, which means that for each object in C, its image under the corresponding functor is a finite dimensional vector space. In other words, these are k-linear functors from C to the category of all finite dimensional k vector spaces. Here is an example. Let k be a field and A an associative and unital k algebra. Consider the category CA with one object i, and such that the morphism set from i to i in this category is equal to our algebra A. The composition is given by multiplication in A, and the identity in this home space is the unit element of A. So the home space is a vector space over k, and the composition is multiplication, which is bilinear. So this is a k-linear category. And now, if you compare the definition of an A module and a CA module, we see that they coincide. So the categories of all CA modules and the categories of all A modules are canonically isomorphic. And this, of course, restricts to a canonical isomorphism between the corresponding categories of all finitely generated modules over A or over CA. Here is a more subtle example. Let k be a field and A a finite dimensional associative and unital k algebra. Let p1, p2, and so on up to pk be a complete but not necessarily irredundant list of indecomposable projective A. For simplicity, let us assume that these modules are pairwise different. They don't have to be pairwise non-isomorphic, but just pairwise different, different objects in A. Mod. And now we consider the category C. It depends on A and on our choice of P1, P2, and so on, PK. 
and it is defined as a full subcategory of A mode with objects P1, P2, and so on, PK. So we have K objects, which are objects of A mode. And of course, since it's a full subcategory of A mode, A mode is a K linear category, then our category C is also K linear. And therefore, the opposite category is also a K linear category. So here is the theorem. The category of all A modules is equivalent to the category of all C op modules. And this equivalence restricts to an equivalence between the corresponding categories of finitely generated. So here is an idea of the proof. Of course, without loss of generality, we may assume that A is basic and that our list of projective modules is irredundant, so they are pairwise non isomorphic. In this case, the algebra A is isomorphic to the opposite of the endomorphism algebra over A of the direct sum of our modules P1, P2, and so on, up to PK. So let us fix such an isomorphism. Using this, we equip A with a complete set of pairwise orthogonal primitive idempotent epsilon i. So here, epsilon i is a projection onto the direct sum on PI, and i ranges between 1 and k. And given an A module M, the collection of epsilon i times M, the collection of the images of this pairwise orthogonal primitive idempotence on our module, this has a natural structure of the module over C op via our isomorphism between A and the endomorphism algebra of the P1 and so on up to PK. Conversely, given a module phi, of C op, the direct sum over all i from 1 to k phi of pi becomes an A module via our fixed isomorphism. And it is very easy to check that this defines mutually inverse equivalences of categories. Next, let us consider the path category of a quiver. Let k be a field and q be a quiver with the vertex set q0 and the arrow set q1. Consider the category PQ defined as follows. The objects of this category are the vertices of Q, and for two vertices U and V, the morphism space in our category from U to V is a vector space of all formal K linear combinations of the set of all passes in Q from U to V. This should be PQ, not Q0. Composition in this category is given by concatenation of passes, and the identities are given by the trivial passes at each vertice, by the identity passes at each vertice. So directly from the definition, the category PQ is K linear, and it's usually called the path category of Q over K. We have now defined the path category of a quiver. This can be further extended to a path category with relation. So let K be a field, Q a quiver and PQ the corresponding path category. For any ideal I in PQ, we can define the corresponding quotient category PQ modulo I. And if we are given some generating set R of this ideal I, then one usually says that this quotient category PQ modulo I is the path category of Q with relations R. Here is an example. Let Q be the following quiver. We have vertices 1, 2, 3, and so on. So vertices are positive integers. And we have an arrow alpha 1 from 1 to 2, alpha 2 from 2 to 3, and so on. So it's the A infinity quiver oriented in one direction. Then in PQ, we have that the morphism space from I to J is 0 if I is greater than J. There are no oriented passes in this quiver from i, which is greater than j, to j. And there is a unique pass if i is less than or equal to j, from i to j. And if we can take as relations uh, that the composition of any two consecutive arrows is zero, then in the corresponding quotient category PQ modulo, the ideal generated by these relations, the corresponding hope set will be zero, from i to j, if j is not i or i plus 1, and it will have dimension 1 if j is i or i plus 1.
Next, let us talk about representable functions. Let k be a field, t a k linear category. Then, for each object i in C, we have the corresponding representable functor of taking homes from this object to blank, and that's a functor from C to k vector spaces. That's because C is a k linear category. If we plug in j instead of blank in this expression, we will get a k vector space. Notation for any C modules m and n, the home set in the category of C modules from m to n, so the set of all natural transformations from the functor m to the functor n, will be denoted as home with then the subscript C from m to n. That's the usual notation as for modules over algebras. For representable functors, we have the very important statement, which is called Yoneda lemma, and it asserts the following. For any module M in C mod, there is an isomorphism between the home set as C modules from the representable functor Ci blank to M and M of I. Proof, this isomorphism is given by sending a natural transformation eta from our representative functor C i blank to M to the value of eta at the identity morphism epsilon i at the vertex i. And this should be compared with the usual formula that for an associative algebra A and an A module M, all as A modules from the left regular A module A to M is isomorphic to M by sending phi, a homomorphism phi, to its value at the element 1 in A. It's exactly the same statement with exactly the same proof. And the corollary from this lemma is that each representable functor is a projective object in C mode. And this is because the functor which sends a C module M to its value at the object I is obviously an exact functor. And by Yoneda lemma, it's isomorphic to the functor of taking homes from the representative functor Ci blank, which means that taking homes from this functor is an exact functor, so the functor Ci blank is projective as an object in C mode. Now we can try to define the class of infinite dimensional objects which we will use as a setup for infinite dimensional generalizations of quasi-hereditary algebra. So these are called locally finitary categories. We want to define some analog of quasi-hereditary algebras in the infinite dimensional setup. And for this, we would need some reasonable finiteness assumptions. And also the unitality condition that we work with unital algebras, this needs to be relaxed. So instead of finite dimensional algebras, we will work with k linear categories with some finiteness restrictions. Here is the main definition. A k linear category C is called strongly locally finitary, provided that all home sets Cij, so they are k vector spaces, so they must be finite dimensional k vector spaces. Moreover, for any i, there should be only finitely many j, such that the corresponding home set is non-zero. And for any j, there should exist only finitely many i, such that the corresponding home set Cij is non-zero. And if we take such strongly locally finitary k-linear category C and just consider its path algebra, then this path algebra will not be unital if C has infinitely many objects. If C has finitely many objects, then the sum of the passes at all vertices will be a unit element. But if C has infinitely many objects, we cannot take infinite sums. So the corresponding pass algebra will not have a unit element. But for each element A, there will be local units which you can multiply on the left this way and on the right, such that A is preserved. So the pass algebra of this category is locally unit. Here is an example. Take the same quiver as before. So the vertices are positive integers, and we have a narrow ai from i to i plus 1. Then for the corresponding path category, we have that all home sets from i to j are finite dimensional, 
they have dimension 0, 1, as we discussed. And for each j, there are only finitely many i, such that pqij is non zero. So if we fix some vertex, there are only finitely many vertices from which we have homes to our fixed vertex. However, from one, we have passes to all other vertices, and there are infinitely many. So pqij is non zero for infinitely many j. Therefore, the path category of this quiver is not strongly locally finite. At the same time, if you factor out the ideal, which is generated by the relations that the composition of two arrows is zero, then for each i, there are only finitely many j's such that the home set in this quotient category from i to j is non zero. Namely, there are two j's, i and i plus one. Therefore, this quotient is a strongly locally finitary category. So here is our setup. K is an algebraically closed field. C is a strongly locally finitary K linear category. And we assume that the set of objects of C is an interval of integers with respect to the usual order. So up to isomorphism, this means that the set of objects of C is either the whole Z, or is the set of all non negative integers, or is the set of all non positive integers or just the set 1, 2, 3, and so on, up to n, or some n. And of course, in the last case, we have finitely many objects, so the endomorphism algebra of the direct sum of all objects in C is finite dimensional, so this case is covered by our classical theory. It corresponds exactly to finite dimensional quasi-hereditary algebras, and now we generalize this to these three other cases. Let us also assume, for simplicity, that the endomorphism algebra of each object in C is local, so this object is indecomposable, and that different objects in C are not isomorphic. So C is basic. Okay, first of all, let us describe simple finite dimensional modules over this category. So for each object i in C, we have the module Li, which is defined as follows. It maps the object i to k and all other objects to zero. It maps the trivial pass at i to the identity operator on k and all morphisms in the radical of cii to zero and of course all other morphisms outside cii to zero because all other objects are mapped to zero. So it is very easy to check that this is a simple C module. It's a one-dimensional module. The sum of dimensions of vector spaces at all points is 1. So this module is one-dimensional, in particular it's finite-dimensional in the sense that the dimension of the direct sum of all Li of j's over all j is finite. So it's, in fact, it's 1. And of course it's clear that Li is isomorphic to Lj if and only if i is equal to j, because we have assumed that different objects in C are not isomorphic. Now we can define standard mode. For i in C, we have the corresponding projective C module PI defined as a representable functor CI blank. So this PI is again finite dimensional in the sense that if we take the direct sum of all CIJs over all Js, this is a finite dimensional vector space because of our assumptions that our category is strongly locally finitary. In particular, it follows that Pi has simple top Li, and also by Yoneda lemma, it is indecomposable because its endomorphism algebra is isomorphic to Cii, which is a local algebra. So now, just as for quasi hereditary algebras, we can define the corresponding standard module delta i as the quotient of Pi modulo the trace in Pi of all pj's where j is greater than i. Then delta i is finite dimensional as a quotient of a finite dimensional module and is indecomposable with simple top li by construction. Now we can define infinite dimensional analogs of quasi-hereditary l. So let k in c be as above. And let f of delta be the category of all finite dimensional c modules 
that have a filtration with standard subgroup. Definition, we will say that our C is quasi-hereditary, provided that each standard module delta I has exactly one composition subquotient isomorphic to L I. And also each projective module P I belongs to F delta, so it has a filtration with standard subquotient. And exactly as for usual quasi-hereditary algebras, the conditions that delta I over L I is equal to one, that the multiplicity of L I and delta I is one, is equivalent to the conditions that the endomorphism algebra of delta i is the field. So delta i is a Schurian module. In the case when C has finitely many objects, this gives exactly the usual definition of our quasi hereditary algebra. Here is an extensive example. Consider the following quiver Q. Now we have objects given by integers. And we have an arrow alpha i from i to i plus 1, and an arrow beta i from i plus y to i. Let's see with the category, which is given by the quotient of the path category of this quiver, modulo the following relation. The composition of two consecutive alphas is 0. The composition of two consecutive betas is 0. And if we are at the object i, and we apply first alpha i and then beta i, we get the same as applying first beta i minus 1 and then alpha i minus 1. Starting from some object, two steps to the right is 0, two steps to the left is 0, to the right and back is equal to the left and back. And the point of this example is that we claim that this category is quasi-hereditary. Let us look at indecomposable projective. So if we start from the point i, then using our three verb, we can do a step to the right. We can go by i alpha i to go to l i plus 1. Or we can do a step to the left. We can use beta i minus 1 to go from l i to l i minus 1. We cannot continue from l i plus 1 to the right because of the relations that two alphas give 0. And from Li minus 1, we cannot continue to the left, because two betas also give 0. So the only thing which we can do is to go back to i from Li plus 1 and Li minus 1. And here we have the relation that right-left is equal to left-right. So we have such a diamond in the Lovi picture. From here, if we do any step to the right or to the left, we can use the same diamond to commute it and we get two alphas or two betas, so we get zero. So this is a complete picture of the indecomposable projective module PI. And here we see that the trace of PI plus one and so on will kill this LI plus one and then the SOCL. And so the standard module delta I will have top LI and SOCL LI minus one, and that's it. And we see that the multiplicity of LI in delta I is one, and we also see that the projective has delta i as a quotient and delta i plus 1 as the kernel of this projection from pi to delta i. Here in the picture, this is our pi, li i minus 1, this is our quotient delta i, and li plus 1 li, this is our kernel delta i plus 1. So projectives have a standard filtration. And it follows that this category C is indeed quasi-hereditary. Let us remark several interesting properties of this category. First of all, it has a simple preserving duality that swaps alpha i and beta i. It's easy to check that the relations are self-dual. Next, all projective modules pi are self-dual and hence also injective. If we take our projective module, this is our projective module PI, and we turn it upside down, we get it back. And the duality, of course, sends projectives to injective, so it is injective. All projective modules are injective, and so our algebra is self injective. And it is not semi simple, projectives are not simple. And now we can notice that such phenomenon is not possible for finite-dimensional quasi-hereditary algebras. 
Because if you have a finite dimensional algebra, which is not semi-simple and self-injective, it has infinite global dimension. And any finite dimensional quasi-hereditary algebra has finite global dimension. So we cannot have non-semi-simple, self-injective, quasi-hereditary finite dimensional algebra. But here we have an infinite dimensional algebra which has all these properties. Also, our category C would remain quasi-hereditary if we reverse the order of objects. So if we just flip it from left to right, the new category will be again quasi-hereditary. And again, this is not possible for non-semi-simple finite dimensional quasi-hereditary algebras which have a simple preserving duality, as our C, by result of Kevin Coulombier. That result says that if we have a quasi-hereditary algebra with a simple preserving duality, then the order for which it is quasi-hereditary is essentially unique. We definitely cannot flip it to take the opposite order. Here are some comments on other sources of interesting examples of infinite alinear categories which give quasi-hereditary algebras and which are strongly locally finitary. Strongly locally finitary infinite dimensional quasi-hereditary algebras appear naturally in category O for Lee super algebras and in several examples inspired by modular representation theory of finite groups. This includes Rombal algebras by Peach and Cubist algebras by Chuang and Turner. For the latter examples, you can take a look at Peach's PhD thesis, which was written in Bristol in 2004, titled Rombal Algebras and Derived Equivalences, and at the paper Cubist Algebras by Chuang and Turner, which appeared in 2008. Here are some extra problems and questions at the end. Problem question one, prove an equivalence between C-op mode and A mode with all details in the beginning of the lecture. Problem question two, prove your net dilemma with all details. Problem question three, check with all details that LIs are simple C modules. Problem question four, construct projective resolutions of standard and simple modules in the last example. And problem question five, what are the tilting modules and the ring yield dual in the last example? Thank you very much and see you next time.